<laughs> All right, let's uh, let's let's get back to it. Hope everyone had a good uh, coffee break. Um, so this is the second half of the Machine Learning Foundation's presentation, and uh, we're going to just kind of pick up uh, where we left off. So we're going to talk about the three primary types of uh, machine learning to see some of the questions that these question answer machines uh, can answer. Oops. All right. So in general, there is under the umbrella of machine learning, we have three general categories of algorithms. So the first one and the one that's used the most in industry applications today is supervised learning. And this is the type of machine learning where we uh, need la labels. We also have unsupervised learning, which uh, labels are not required and it kind of extracts some patterns from the data. And then reinforcement learning, which is a very dynamic approach to learning. And uh, Rich Sutton, who's a chief scientific officer of Amy, is uh, one of the founders of the field. So let's look a little bit uh, closer at, at all these three categories. So before uh, we continue, let's talk very briefly about uh, data light labels. So we see here, we have a bunch of uh, data and on the left-hand side here, we have just kind of pictures of cats and dogs. So going back to the example from before. So in the left uh, examples here, we have actual labels. So we have the labels of dog or cat there. On the middle column here, we have actually the weight of each pet. So we have the weights of the dogs and the weights of the cats. However, on the right-hand side, we have unlabeled data. So we have uh, no labels at all in the data. We just have the raw pictures of the cats and dogs. So in this case, um, a feature is any characteristic of the data. So for instance, in the table that you see at the top here, uh, a feature could be the name of the pet, for instance. And then a label is the feature that you want to predict specifically. So let's say you have every other feature and you're trying to predict the label. So for instance, let's say that we don't know the type of the pet in this table here, but you do know that the name of the pet is Polly, the color is green, and the weight is three pounds. The uh, label would then be, you would try to predict what animal it is. And it seems reasonable to say that Polly is probably a bird in this case. So that's the difference between a feature is just a characteristic of your data set, whereas a label is what you're specifically trying to predict within your data set. So supervised learning uses patterns to try to predict labels. And in order to do supervised learning, it requires correctly labeled examples. So some examples of supervised learning tasks are things such as spam filters. If you had the true uh, knowledge of whether or not emails were uh, spam or not spam, then you would be able to potentially make a spam filter. Or also handwriting rec recognition. There is thousands of images online of just people's handwritten uh, running digits. And you can build a uh, supervised learning algorithm to try to predict what uh, digit was in a new image. Um, you might have seen online too those like uh, online captions. So those things that are trying to say I'm not a robot, and they have maybe like a three by three grid of a bunch of images, and they say label all of the buses in this image. It turns out that that's actually you labeling a big supervised learning data set because uh, the system is not actually picking up whether you're a human or not based on your responses. It's picking that up based on the time that it took you to click all the examples. So that's actually you helping label a supervised learning set. So each time you do a capture, you can think about that. So here's an example of a, a task a supervised learning can solve, which is classification of mosquitoes. So the problem here is different mosquito sp uh, species can carry uh, different types of diseases. And different mosquito species can be very, very difficult to tell apart, even by trained entomologists who are very specialized in this, in this field. So a classification machine learning algorithm was developed by some researchers at the University of Rhode Island, and it's helped with, uh, to better improve mosquito surveillance to see which mosquitoes are in a population to control the diseases that are spread by them. And here's how it works. So it starts on the left with entomologists labeled hundreds of images with the correct species of a mosquito in the image. So then using the same process that we we're talking about before, we have all the labeled data, we run it through a learning algorithm and we get a question and answering machine that was able to kind of pick up on st some statistical parts of what made certain species a mosquito or what made cer uh, certain images a mosquito a certain species. And so it picked up on these patterns. And then when a new mosquito is presented to the machine learning system at the top there, it's able to run through the question answering machine 
and predict that this is species one, for instance. I don't actually know the different types of species of mosquitoes that exist. Um, and so this is a classification task. And in classification tasks, you would uh, answer questions such as, what category does this example belong to? So in the previous example, that was what class of mosquito this is. And then you could also ask a question, is this example in class A or not? So in the example of the uh, spam uh, detection uh, for emails, that would say, is this email spam or not? Here's another task that supervised learning can do. So this was a Latin America consumer go uh, goods company and uh, it provided animal feed and they wanted to turn to a machine learning system to really uh, help kind of with a big problem that they found, which is that a lot of costs for fish farmers came from purchasing food. However, a lot of this food was left over or wasted because they weren't able to actually, actually accurately predict how much food uh, the fish would actually consume. So this doesn't seem like something that can be solved with classification though. Because in this case, instead of saying, does this uh, example belong to class A or class B, we're now trying to predict how much food uh, is needed. And this is actually an example of a regression task, which is another thing that supervised learning is really good at. And the way that it works is from a bunch of past examples where we actually knew how much food a uh, fish would need, we're able to take in some parts of the data here. So maybe the temperature that the fish were in or the oxygen level that, uh, that they were in as well. So we took a bunch of these examples of the data here and we actually knew how much food was required for the fish in that case. So that's the orange column, which is the label we're trying to predict against. We then pass all of this data through a learning algorithm to produce a question and answer machine, which again, picks up on some of the patterns that we have in the data set again. And then when we have a new species of fish, so we have a salmon with a certain temperature and oxygen level, we're able to use this question and answer machine to predict how much food it will uh, require. So in regression tasks in general, a regression task can answer questions such as, how, how much of this will we uh, needed today? So it could say how much food is needed for the fish today. Or it might be able to answer questions such as what amount is appropriate for this example? So like for instance, Airbnb could use regression to uh, say um, what amount is appropriate for this uh, housing accommodation for the weekend. So we so far talked about supervised learning where labels are needed. However, in a lot of cases, we actually won't have labels. And in this case, we turn to something called unsupervised learning. And this is when we're finding patterns in unlabeled data. So it looks for patterns, relationships, and anomalies that might exist. So one example of this is Amazon and Netflix use this all the time in their recommendation systems. And basically in these recommendation systems, they're gonna recommend similar products to a user based on the products that they think they might like, but they may not actually know the true label here. So they kind of try to kind of cluster your behavior around a certain set to predict new shows and movies you may like. And these actually predict, uh, account for 35% of purchases on Amazon is based on their recommendation systems. And on Netflix, about 75% of what consumers watch are based purely on these recommendation systems. So they've done a really good job of trying to predict what you will like. Um, another uh, common application of unsupervised learning is also detecting fraud. So if you have a whole normal set of transactions and you're trying to say, is this a transaction a normal transaction or is it kind of a out of the pattern transaction, you can predict fraud in that sense. So let's look a little bit closer and see how unsupervised learning works uh, through two examples. And one example is trying to understand animal feelings, which is a very interesting problem in general. So Deep Squeak, which was an initiative by some researchers at the University of Washington, they were trying to identify, process, and sort different uh, rat and mouse squeaks to try to understand their feelings. And how it works is they basically have all of these squeak audio files are given to a machine learning algorithm. So we have them all kind of processed here on this 2D array. We can then maybe have an expert kind of come in or the algorithm can actually group runs that uh, look similar together based on certain characteristics of the squeaks. And you can start to see some groups emerge here. So we have three separate groups, which we typically refer, refer to as clusters. Now that we have these clusters, an expert then can then look at the clusters and specifically label them based on the feelings that they think that an animal is trying to communicate. So maybe in the bottom cluster here, the rats are feeling sad. 
maybe in the one further to the right, the uh, rats are feeling happy. And then in the top left, they're maybe feeling pain. So presumably the assumption that they're kind of making that underlines all of this is that similar squeaks based on kind of how they're mapped in this 2D grid contain similar emotional information. So when we have a new sound come in, we would then map it again to this 2D grid and we're trying to see what other squeaks is this one most similar to. And in this one, it's kind of on the boundary between being happy and sad. So based on maybe some other uh, uh, things that we might uh, know here, we might either label it uh, to the uh, class of happy or label it to the class of sad. I think in this case, sadly, it was a sad rat. So a clustering task can answer new questions such as what group is this new example most similar to? So in the last slide, again, we had the new sound come in. We said it was most similar to all the other sounds that we saw that were sad. Or it could also say what associations are common and important for an example to be part of a cluster. And this is really important for some fraud cases. So Dark Trace is a cybersecurity firm based out of the Cambridge United Kingdom. And uh, they use machine learning to watch for suspicious activities that can happen both internally and externally to an organization that might indicate a digital threat. And they've worked with many of these uh, organizations to watch for things like uh, phishing attacks and unauthorized uh, data exfiltration. And they're able to do this with very minimal human intervention as well. And here's how it works. So they start by clustering together all the normal digital activities of an organization. So they kind of have this convex polygon here that kind of clusters all the normal activity that uh, consumers uh, might use when interacting with this product. So then when a new activity comes in, it would again map it to this grid and it would say that new activities that don't cluster well with all the normal set of activities can be flagged for further investigation. And then you could actually have a person come in and say, okay, why is this a little bit different than a, per a person's normal set of activities? And this can also be used, for instance, with credit card transactions. So in credit card transactions, you have a normal set of transactions that a person makes on their card on a day-to-day -day basis. And all of a sudden, if it maybe says, okay, it knows that you're based in Edmonton, it sees that I have a purchase in London, they're going to say, wait a minute, that doesn't cluster with your normal set of uh, transactions. And then it may, uh, call, my credit card company might call me and say, hey, are you in London or what's going on here? So it can pick up on some certain things to try to detect out of transaction activities and try to detect fraud before it may happen. So an anomaly detection task, which the last one was, which was trying to detect fraud, could say, which examples do not belong to any uh, cluster? Or what characteristic does an example not have to not be a part of a cluster? So in the example with the credit card transactions, again, if I'm not in Edmonton and making a huge purchase somewhere else overseas, then it's probably not a part of my normal cluster of uh, uh, purchases. Okay, so we've seen supervised learning, we've seen unsupervised learning. Now reinforcement learning is a third category of algorithms for machine learning. And reinforcement learning learns from continuous experience. So it learns from basically the way that a person or agent would interact with an environment. And the overall goal of reinforcement learning systems is to maximize rewards from the environment. So you can think of this very similar to how humans interact and you perform an action, you get a reward based on your environment, and then you try to learn the actions that lead to a larger reward over time. And this is known as something called action control, where you basically are trying to choose an action in response to the feedback that you get from your environment. And reinforcement learning has been used with really great success and University of Alberta is a world leader in reinforcement learning. And it's been used with great success in tasks such as self-driving cars, and also at playing games as well, with DeepMind using it for a lot of their programs. Um, but as a cautionary tale, reinforcement learning agents often start out really poorly. So they do not know the right actions at first, so they might make totally random actions to begin with, and they might get really low reward. So for a lot of scenarios, it would need to be started and trained in a simulator where the impact of these incorrect actions are minimized. If you think about it, if you just had a self-driving car and you wanted to train it, if you just put that self-driving car in the road without it actually knowing how to drive, that would be a really scary scenario since maybe it would go up to 150 kilometers per hour out of the blue or it would perform actions randomly. But if you're able to train it on your computer first in a simulated environment, and then after doing a lot of training in the simulated environment, are very confident that it's gonna perform well, 
only at that point would you actually take the self-driving car and put it on a road where the consequences of an incorrect action would be severe. So as an example of reinforcement learning that's being done uh, locally here in Edmonton is the bionic limbs for improved natural control or the Blink Lab. Uh, Dr. Uh, Patrick Polarski and his team are using reinforcement learning to smooth the interaction between a person with an amputation and their prosthetic device. So, okay, so it's a two-step process basically. Uh, so users learn to have to typically learn to adapt to their prosthetic device. However, what they were specifically doing was they're having their pros prosthetic lives devices learn to adapt to the specific users. So the prosthetic devices were trying to predict what actions a user might want to take. So then it would be able to you know, better facilitate the use of that prosthetic device. So on the user side, uh, prosthetic users are given a set of joints that they can control um, with their device. And then they can switch between the joints that they use uh, using different muscle contractions as well. And the reward that the user might get for using the system is whether their actions led to the joint uh, moving or not. So that's typically how a user would interact with it. But oftentimes there's many more actions that a user can make with a prosthetic device that are easily available for them to uh, choose from. So what the Blink team basically wanted to do was they wanted to create an RL system which would predict which joint a prosthetic device user uh, intended to use next, as well as what action they intended to use with it. And um, this allowed them to kind of reorder the available actions to the user to try to um, make it easier for them to use this device. So from the uh, prosthesis side, uh, so they basically had this continual control process where the system would observe the placement of the prosthesis device and the muscle signal signals of the user and the sensor readings as well. And this would kind of define the environment or the state of the agent here. Um, it would then try to to determine the action, which would be, it would recommend the order of joints the user is likely to move next. And then the user can then give it a performance rating. It can say, yes, I actually did intend to, to uh, move this joint, or maybe no, I didn't intend to move this joint. And based on the performance rating, over time, uh, this reinforcement learning system can learn to really accurately predict which joints the user intended to use next. So it's able to do a really good job of predicting that ahead of time which can really help out prosthesis users. So in general, a reinforcement learning task answers questions such as what action should I take next based on the conditions that I'm in right now and how well that action has uh, performed for me in the past. So it's also kind of learning some of these correlations, but it's learning it based on the right actions to take in an environment. And then maybe it'll also learn things such as what adjustments will get the system closer to its ideal state. So you might have a ideal state of a game that you want to get to and what adjustments should I make to playing this game in order to get to the uh, better way of playing it. So in general, in summary, the learning algorithms fall into three big categories here. You have supervised learning, which is learning from labeled data, unsupervised learning, which is learning from unlabeled data and reinforcement learning, which is learning from continual experience uh, in an environment. So based on the data we have, we can then uh, ask uh, specific questions that are most easily answered by each type of machine learning. Are there any questions on this last section? All right, hearing none, I'm gonna go through this section a bit quickly because I have some uh, other really exciting stuff I wanna talk about, but it is important to note the types of data that we have. So broadly speaking, there's kind of three different uh, types of data we have. We have structured data, which can be uh, data in spreadsheets and, and things like that. We have semi-structured data, which contains some elements of being structured, some elements of being unstructured. And then we have unstructured data, which might be like natural language or images that you take with your phone or videos or audio files. And those are more difficult to use in general. So structured data looks like this. You probably have worked with it before if you've used Microsoft Excel or other uh, things along those lines. And it basically is data in a spreadsheet. And this is the easiest for machine learning algorithms to work with because it's primarily just a bunch of numbers. And machines work really well when it's able to think in terms of numbers. So by far, once you have the structured data, 
it can be the easiest to create a machine learning model based on it. So semi-structured data contains some elements of being structured and some elements of being unstructured. So in this example, we have an employee satisfaction survey and the employees at the first part are giving ratings based on their satisfaction. And if these are in an easily uh, uh, to use format, so such as how satisfied they are with their compensation and stuff like that, then that would be structured data at the top. But then at the bottom, they have employee morale where they're asking for a natural language response, like um, define your general happiness with this company. And then the uh, free written response to that would be unstructured data in the other uh, case. So unstructured data are things such as these. So you have a tweet on the left with an image and a caption. You have in the middle, a picture of a, a, a baby giraffe. And then on the right, you have a quote from Douglas Adams at the restaurant at the end of the universe. And there's so much unstructured data that exists, which both makes it difficult for some machine learning algorithms to use, but it also creates unprecedented opportunity for people to really extract insights from this unstructured data. And there's a lot of techniques that are being used uh, nowadays specifically for certain types of unstructured data. So you might have heard of natural language processing, which specifically tries to generate insights um, from natural language and the way that people speak. There's also uh, computer vision systems, which try to learn certain things based on images, so such as the image in the middle here. So there's a lot of work that's being done to try to generate insights from this unstructured data, but it can be very difficult in general. We also have metadata, which is data that describes data. And metadata can help you organize, find, and even understand data. So in this case, we have a picture of a cat. Sadly, this isn't a picture of one of my own cats. But we have metadata as well that's associated with it. And it might be a bit hard to read there, but we have things such as the aperture that the photo was taken, or the uh, lens that was used, or the shutter speed, or uh, the location of the image. And this basically makes it a lot easier for uh, your phones or devices to sort the images based on certain criteria. So like if you go into your uh, photos app on your phone, you'll probably see it sorted by date. It's able to do that because there's metadata that's associated with each image, which says the date that it was taken. Or you might be able to sort the images on your phone based on all the pictures you have of the University of Alberta. It's able to do that because it has metadata based on the location of where each image was taken. So data alone often isn't sufficient for machine learning applications. So having good metadata can really help improve machine learning algorithms because it can describe what the data is specifically about. So in a spreadsheet, basically everything in the spreadsheet beyond the actual values in it is metadata because it describes the data. So for instance, the column header that says that the month that uh, something was taken in or the forecast, all of those columns are examples of metadata. So collecting good uh, metadata, there's kind of two questions to be thinking about here. You can think of what additional context can I provide and um, uh, how will I keep the metadata alongside the data itself? And some data is easier for machines to use and some data is more difficult for machines to use. So tabular data with numbers only, that's the absolute easiest for machines to use because they're really good at just crunching numbers. Um, then we have tabular data with text or sensor telemetry. Then we have uh, images, text documents, audio and video, kind of somewhere in between because that's much more unstructured. Because ultimately when a computer is working with data, it still is fundamentally working with zeros and ones. Just because it's presented in a pretty way on your screen in an intuitive way, internally still, it is represented all as zeros and ones. And the higher level of abstraction away from the zeros and ones it gets, the more difficult it can be to work with. Um, so like even an image is still represented internally as zeros and ones, but it's based on like the pixel values at each uh, location in the image. So when we get all the way down to the bottom, handwritten scanned documents, as I know this is an AI and medicine symposium, so I know doctors oftentimes don't have the best handwriting. So trying to learn things based on handwriting doctor images could be a very difficult task in general, because even people can't read it sometimes. So take home message here is that it can vary in structure. And the amount of structure dictates the ease of use uh, that the data can be used by machine learning algorithms. Are there any questions on this last section? Okay. So we're gonna just kind of sw uh, switch the picture a little bit here. 
we're going to be talking a little bit about the uh, business side of machine learning for a little bit. So we're going to talk about some constraints that may uh, apply to your machine learning system. And so this was kind of the diagram of the business side of machine learning. And constraints are kind of part of the context that needs to be applied here. So if someone's thinking about machine learning from a business perspective, they'll think of the desired outcome they want to have happen, what actions can help promote that outcome, what judgments might apply to those actions. And then overall, they'll end up getting a question answering machine, which will be done on the technical side that the technical people will implement. But there's overall a higher level context that needs to be considered here. And what are the constraints that need to be considered? So some common constraints include the accuracy of a system, for instance, or the speed of a system. And it also can in include certain things such as the explainability of a system, how easy it is to explain the decision that a machine learning system made. Or it could also think of fairness and how different groups of people are being treated by a machine learning uh, algorithm as well. So on accuracy, we kind of have two sides of, of the uh, picture here. So on the left, we have accuracy can be low and we're okay with making mistakes. And on the right, we have accuracy must be very high. So within these kind of two extremes, where would you all put movie recommendations? Like Netflix recommending movies to watch. Which side of this would you put movie recommendations on? See, is the majority of people signaling all right, this way for left side, this way for right side. Okay, this is hard to read. I'm gonna say that it seems like the majority of people are signaling left. So the accuracy can be low with uh, movie recommendation systems. If Netflix recommends a movie to you, you don't end up watching it. There's really not too much harm. Now, how about this? What about self-driving cars? Which side would you put self-driving cars? Should the accuracy, yeah. <laughs> See, everyone kind of pointing this way now. So with self-driving cars, you expect that the accuracy must be very, very high because the mistakes of a self-driving car makes a mistake could have severe uh, consequences on a person's life. So accuracy can be uh, lower in systems where it's less critical and it must be high in systems that are very critical. So there we have recommendation systems and there we have autonomous vehicles. So the question that you might ask here and you might ask uh, to your uh, business team is what is the minimum accuracy that you must have for your system to be useful? You also sometimes have to think of speed. So you have to think of the speed that you go from the prediction that your machine learning system gives to the action that you take. So do we need the system to respond immediately or is it okay for there to be a delay? And how much delay is acceptable between prediction and action that we take on that prediction? So on, we have kind of two ends of the spectrum here. On the left, we have responses can lag and can be a little bit slower. Whereas on the right, the responses must be real time or they must be as close to real time as possible. So for instance, chatbots. Uh, if you're interacting with a customer service chatbot that's kind of giving you recommendations for the next steps to make, maybe you have a broken computer and you're trying to get some advice on what to do about that, you would hope that chatbot responses are as close to real time as possible. And companies will kind of impose that constraint on systems um, because if you have a user who's upset about a product, if they're waiting for 15 or 30 minutes for a response from a chatbot, they're probably just gonna get more upset and might not use your product in the future. Whereas a configuration optimizer, which is basically a system that gives recommendations for the design of a warehouse and like where all the pieces should go, it might give this recommendation, but it might not need to be immediate. It might be take days, weeks, or even months before the recommendations that the system makes are actually deployed. And that's okay because it's not as pressing of a problem. So it's hopefully helping out with something in the long run, but it doesn't need to be done immediately. So the constraint question that you would ask here is what is the minimum speed that you need for your system to actually be useful? And as a note here, there's often a big time, a trade-off between speed and accuracy. So if you want your system to be faster, for instance, um, then it could kind of sacrifice on accuracy a little bit. Or if you want it to be really accurate, it might have slower speed. So it's often kind of like the no free lunch thing, where if you're gonna get one thing, you often have to give something else out up, uh, to get it. Now, there are two other really big important constraints that you have to think of too, which include explainability, which is specifically, do you need to explain why the system made its prediction? And then fairness as well. How are you gonna assure that people are treated fairly by your machine learning system? 
So explainability is, will the people affected by your question answering machine expect an explanation, explanation for how the answer was reached? And this shows up in so many different applications. So it shows up in medical applications, uh, legal applications, and financial applications as well, as well as many others. So the question you'd ask here is, do you need to explain why the system made its prediction? Let's look really quickly at a specific medical ap application of explainability. So you might have seen IBM's Watson, which was used on Jeopardy as to beat human champions at the game of Jeopardy, which is a really impressive feat. However, they often were uh, also were using IBM Watson for oncology or the study of cancer, and it was trying to use to help make predictions about the right course of treatment for a specific patient. However, the use of IBM Watson for oncology was a failure because it ultimately wasn't able to explain how it got to the decisions or recommendations that it made. So uh, in, in this context, domain experts should have been able to kind of come into the system and say that this wouldn't be acceptable because both the people that are being affected and the physicians as well are gonna expect uh, recommendations from the system. So even though the system might've had really high accuracy, if it's not able to actually explain how it got to those decisions, and especially a very life and death scenario like that, um, it will not be used. So IBM has still found other uses for Watson. However, it's mostly uh, stayed away from the medical domain because people really expect ex explanations when it comes to their personal health. So fairness, will the people affected by your question answering machine be treated unfairly or unequally by your system? So uh, have people or groups been historically treated uh, unequally in terms of the decisions your question answering machine are making? And then how are you going to make sure that people are treated fairly? So there's a lot of notions in the uh, literature right now for fairness in general, and it's still a very new term that people are trying to figure out uh, what the best definitions for fairness are. Um, there's a lot of examples of, for instance, in the US law, they have a notion of disparate impact, which basically means that the, um, ratio between two groups that are receiving a positive decision on something can't be more than a certain percentage. So let's say that a company hired 50% uh, of all men who applied for a job, but only 20% of all females, that would fail the disparate impact check because there's a big discrepancy between those two percentages. So there's a lot of different notions in the literature right now for different definitions of fairness. But it's important to note that uh, computers can both help uh, improve people's lives and they can make people's uh, lives worse with some of the decisions they make. So here's an example of actually a machine learning system that was being used alongside doctors that was actually able to improve upon the predictions that doctors were making. So for arthritis uh, patients in particular, they found that a machine learning system that was being used to predict the level of pain that these patients were feeling was more accurate than just the doctors by themselves. And it was especially more accurate uh, for black patients. And the reason that this happened was the conclusion was that some doctors had implicit biases where they underestimated the amount of pain that black patients were feeling. So the machine learning system was actually able to correct for that in some ways. And it was actually able to improve the predictions in that case. So that's an example of the machine learning system being used alongside doctors to improve um, a fairness for different groups of people. However, Machines can also do things such as this. So in 2014, Amazon started building an AI recruitment tool and they wanted to completely automate hiring uh, so that maybe hundred resumes are submitted and they choose the top five of all these resumes. However, only four years later, uh, Amazon had to scrap the system entirely because they couldn't get the system to stop discriminating against women. And we'll talk about ways that these discriminations and these biases can creep into machine learning uh, systems in the next section. But it's important to note that in some cases, AI can do a really good job at correcting some implicit biases that humans have. And in other cases, it can just kind of exasperate some of these biases that might have existed. So take home message here is that thinking about the necessary constraints is a very important part of building any AI system. These include things such as the accuracy, speed, and speed of your system, as well as the explainability and fairness as well. Are there any questions on this last section? All right, seeing none, let's talk a little bit about a responsible AI. So using AI for really good purposes. So 
the uh, Capgemini Research Institute found that, well, about half of consumers feel they have been impacted personally by the impact of ethical AI. About 77% of technical executives are unsure about ethics and transparency of AI systems. However, at the same time, they found that consumers who perceive, uh, perceive their use of an AI interaction as being done in an ethical way, they will actually be much more loyal to that company. So there's both good humanist reasons for doing responsible AI, as well as business reasons for doing it as well, because you might have more loyal customers if they know that you're doing AI in an ethical way. So why responsible AI? And responsible development is very important in any tech discipline where you're making a product that is going to impact people's lives. However, it's especially important in the uh, artificial intelligence world as well. So AI systems are already widely used and they're only becoming more common and more powerful as time goes on. So they are more able to impact people's lives in that way. The other reason is that uh, AI systems uh, learn from historical data. And so they have the chance to uh, pick up on historical trends and they have the chance to amplify bias patterns which might have existed in the historical data. And so also kind of going back to the notion of explainability, many AI systems are what are known as black box systems, which means something goes into the system, something comes out, but it's not exactly clear how we went from the input to the output. So to have transparency and accountability with the AI systems can make it a bit more complicated, but if you have more transparency, it's a really good thing to be able to explain how the AI system uh, came up with its decision. So let's talk about the middle point for a second here. Let's talk about how bias patterns can creep into the data. So this was the uh, diagram that we were looking at a little bit earlier, where we were talking about the two sides, the development side and the testing side. So on the de development side, the way that the question answering machine is built is based upon the learning data here. And as far as the question answering machine is concerned, the only thing it's learning from is from this learning data. So they think that the learning data is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Whereas when humans are looking at learning data, they can recognize that, you know what, there might be more um, context or considerations that need to be made here. So we're able to sometimes discern and distinguish between certain things, whereas machine learning systems are just optimizing for a single thing. So they're just gonna learn based upon this learning data. And you might ask, why is learning data biased? So this diagram I took here uh, was from a paper a framework for understanding sources of uh, harm throughout the machine learning lifecycle. And it kind of highlights three uh, uh, places where learning data can be biased. So the first one is historical bias. So even if data is perfectly measured and sampled, which often is not reasonably the case because people make mistakes, the machine learning model is still gonna learn the world as it is or as it was which can sometimes pick up on past historical trends, which might be biased. So it might be possible for, because it's learning based on historical data to potentially reinforce a stereotype that might've existed um, in the past. There's also the instance of representation bias. So this is if uh, the sample you learn on is different from your target population. So maybe you're learning on a target of people in a medical domain between the ages of 18 and 40. And maybe only 5% of the people in that age group are pregnant. So if you're then trying to build a machine learning model that's trying to predict something about people that are pregnant, your data is not actually representative of that entire group because 95% of the data it's learning on are not representative of the group that you're trying to look at. Then finally, measurement bias. Uh, so I mentioned that a lot of times we do not measure data perfectly and there will be mistakes or we'll be using some type of estimate when measuring things. So if we're not measuring things that we actually want to measure, this can also uh, have some bias that creeps into systems. So we're gonna break down all three sources of this bias uh, very shortly here. So the first one is historical bias and word embeddings. And word embeddings are basically a way uh, that uh, uh, these machine learning systems are able to learn from news sources. So they learn from Wikipedia, a bunch of news articles, online written text. And so they're learning from a bunch of historical data in the past. And they then try to learn embeddings of certain words that are based upon all of this historical data. And then they use something called a word to back where it tries to kind of cluster certain words together. And you can see here that the occupations uh, based on different genders are very much those stereotypes. And this is because it's picked up on all this historical data that has existed in the past. 
And this doesn't just exist for word embeddings. It exists, um, or it doesn't just uh, happen in word embeddings for gender. It also happens for other things such as race and other groups as well. Is that it's learning based on all this historical data, so online news sources and stuff, and it's picking up on all those trends. For example, representation bias. So this was an example of someone that Amy worked with. It was an oil and gas company that created a machine learning system, which was trying to use oil flow uh, data in a pipe to predict something about that, but they only had data for winter months. So this is representation bias because it was learning something based on the winter months, and then they were trying to use it based on every single season. So if you use something that was learned only for the winter, and then try to apply it to a problem in the summer, that's not really fully representative of the full scenario. So you want to make sure that the data set is diverse enough to uh, encompass all these different possibilities. So you might be wondering, how can you minimize uh, bias in data? And seeing what is not there can be really tricky, tricky because it involves explicitly questioning assumptions that you might not even be aware of. Um, so for example, medical research data sets, they don't uh, disaggregate by sex, even though there's been numerous studies that have shown that uh, different genders react to different treatments in different ways. So there's different uh, things that uh, you might not even be considering when you're looking at kind of some of these uh, machine learning problems. So how can you minimize harm from bias? So one thing that you should do is absolutely involve a diverse group of people in your data and machine learning processes. Also bringing in outside experts. So bringing in domain experts who actually know the field really well and can pick up on certain trends and observations that you might not be able to pick up on can be really helpful. Uh, you also wanna ensure that the new parameters that you use in these studies are comprehensively and empirically tested to make sure that they're actually working for what you want them to uh, do. You should try to ba balance some degree of explainability with performance. Um, it's again, kind of that trade off there between the two things but you do ultimately want a system that can explain why it's making certain decisions. And finally, something that we see a lot of uh, happens is monitor and retrain models with new data. So in the case of the word to vec uh, model as well, that was learning the word embeddings, you can train it on new data as more gender neutral towards certain occupations, which then might uh, have less of an impact on the certain occupations that predict certain genders on having. So the take home message on this last section here is it is safe to assume that bias exists in all data and it comes in and creeps in at many different places in the process. So before starting an AI project, you should work to identify and reduce this uh, data bias and the potential harms it, it can cause. So you have a really powerful tool with using an AI uh, and machine learning, but with great power also comes great responsibility to make sure that you're counting for all the bias that might exist. Are there any questions on this last section? Okay, I just have uh, one more section to get through. So the last section is metrics and proxies. So basically what a metric is, is it's the precise ideal measure for interest for evaluating a question answer machine's a performance uh, from the perspective of what the ultimate business outcome uh, is. So for Amy, some potential metrics that we might optimize for is the number of people we educate through these machine learning courses or the number of projects that we engage in with some industry partners, for instance. So there's some important considerations to think of for metrics though. So the first one is that metrics are almost always proxies. And this is what I was talking about with the measurement bias side is that oftentimes it's really difficult to perfectly measure exactly what you wanna measure. So you have to use a proxy, which is kind of a rough estimate for what you want to be measuring instead. The second one in metrics can and will be game. People will always try to find ways around the system uh, to improve things. So they have the potential for some uh, bias there. And then metrics can also overemphasize short-term benefits over long-term gain. So let's really quickly dive into what proxies are. This is another source of bias in the data. So the proxy is a measure that some substitutes something that cannot be directly measured, a standard value for something that you do want to measure. So a proxy is a measure that isn't perfectly aligned with the stated goal of a system, but it works well kind of as, a, as an approximate goal. So here's some common proxies that are used in real life. So every day in every industry, we're using these substitute measures. 
So a course mark or a grade point on average is only a proxy for a person's understanding of a concept. It doesn't encompass the fully nuanced way that they understand a topic. It's only an estimate of the way that they understand this field. So here's a question for all of you. What is a good proxy for a person's financial responsibility? Credit score. Credit score, great. So a credit score is a proxy for financial responsibility and ability to repay a loan. Here's another question. What would be a good proxy for a person's intelligence or their ability to solve certain problems? Yeah. Exactly. So an IQ test is a, is a proxy or a rough estimate for how well a person can problem solve. So to so note here, metrics are almost always proxies. So you often can't directly measure the things you want to do. You can only measure kind of approximates in them. So as an example of something that was happening here is some schools in the US, they use student test scores as a proxy uh, for teacher quality. And actually through doing this, they ended up firing some of their best teachers. And the school boards were well-intentioned with using this, but it's often not the, uh, and it's easy for them to use because uh, test scores are ubiquitous and standardized, but they're not a very good proxy. And the reason for that is first off, it penalizes teachers who emphasize integrity. Because some teachers might try to game the system and have their students cheat on a standardized test just because it in, you know, increases their job uh, likelihood of keeping their job. It also doesn't emphasize the growth in classes. It only takes into account the final point that a class was at, but it doesn't take into account the amount of growth. Because if a student a class really started good and they only improved marginally throughout the year, um, then that teacher is gonna look better than a class that started really poorly and improved a lot throughout the year. So what would be a valid proxy? A valid proxy is something that has been tested and shown to measure what we actually want to measure. So for instance, the level, the level of mercury in a calibrated thermometer is a valid proxy for temperature. And the reason why is it's been rigorously tested across many different conditions and it's maintained its high accuracy. So we know that this really, really closely measures uh, temperature well. However, an invalid proxy, for instance, is in the United States, healthcare cost is an invalid proxy for a person's health. And the reason for that is it does not actually, actually, actually accurately predict a person's health. Instead, it only identifies people who utilize healthcare a lot. And uh, so instead of having data about someone who has serious medical conditions happen to them, they instead, instead only had data about people who had access to medical care or chose to go to a doctor. And this can be significantly biased for many reasons because it has uh, only people who have health insurance or can afford their copay would go. Um, it only uh, people who can take time off of work or find childcare could go as well. And there's also some gender and racial biases uh, that can impact who get an actual accurate diagnosis as well. So metrics can and will be gamed as well. Whenever there's a chance to game the system, uh, people will try to do that. So an uh, automated essay scoring, uh, it heavily focuses on things like sentence length, vocabulary, a subject verb agreement and uh, spelling. And some of these systems can be totally fooled by nonsense essays that just have sophisticated vocabulary and just, you know, put a lot of sentences that are actually accurate without actually making any semantic point or actually making, uh, putting anything reasonable. And the reason for that is it's not able to actually accurately uh, distinguish and uh, assess things that are much more nuanced, uh, like creativity, for instance, which are much more difficult uh, to um, judge. And also, also metrics can overemphasize short-term benefit. So Microsoft found that the worse the search results that they, the Bing search engine returned, the higher the advertising revenue. And you might be wondering why. And that's because poor search results actually resulted in people spending more time on the system because they couldn't find what they wanted at first. So it gave them more opportunities to keep searching, which had more opportunities to keep showing advertisements. So in the short term, this is good for them. People stay on their system for a longer time. However, in the long run, I don't personally know anyone who uses Bing. I don't use it myself. People will then shift to using other engines like Google, DuckDuckGo, or other engines, which are much more reliable. So in the short term, good for them. In the long term, it's terrible. Another example that came out recently was uh, Facebook or Meta. 
with the uh, whistleblower that said that the only thing that the uh, system was optimizing for was the amount of time that a user spent on the system. So to do this, they found that uh, it was actually actively showing users content that would make them angry and make them hateful and like make them really upset is then they'd spend more time in the comment section arguing with people or they found that it's very harmful for uh, teenage girls and their mental health as well. And it was doing all these really terrible things just to make people spend more time on their system. So in the short term, good for Facebook or Meta, in the long term, even companies or even entire countries like the uh, European Union are now saying, you know what, Meta can go screw off. We don't really care if they don't want to be uh, here anymore. So it's bad public relations for the long run, but good for them in the short term. So some principles of good metrics. Uh, you oftentimes want to use multiple metrics. Uh, you want to also try to include both quantitative, so things that you can measure, and qualitative, which are kind of more subjective metrics as well. You want to involve a diverse range of uh, stakeholders in this, because a diverse range of uh, people can all assess how these metrics might impact the system. And then metrics should not be goals, and goals should not be metrics as well. So this is an example of Goodhart's law, which basically says that as soon as a metric becomes a target, it ceases to become a good metric. And as an example of this, maybe a customer uh, service call center tracks the amount of time that an agent spends on the phone with a person. And um, if they only are making that a goal to have shorter phone calls, that's okay. But all of a sudden, if they make it a goal that all phone calls have to be five minutes or less, then it becomes a terrible measure. Because instead of uh, trying to actually provide good service to a person, the customer service agent will just try to get them off the phone as soon as they can. So it'll cease to become a good target when it uh, becomes a goal for a company. So the take home message here is keeping in mind what metrics your system is optimizing for can help avoid unwanted consequences. So you want to take a very intentional approach to identify what proxies are being done. And this can be very important for mitigating uh, a lot of problems that you run into or life cycle switches in the whole machine learning process. So that was basically it for what I had for today. So we had summary, we talked about Amy and some definitions in the field. We talked about how machine learning worked from a very high level uh, overview. We talked about the different types of machine learning that can exist, um, the types of data that exist and how to avoid bias in the data. And then we talked, uh, finished by talking about responsible AI. So if you don't mind, you can take a brief survey. It's a little QR code there that you can scan on your phone. Just let's, let us know how we did. It really helps me out. It helps Amy out as well when we're trying to target these uh, future uh, services towards everyone. So we'll leave that up for a minute. I think it's just one short question. All right, we'll also open the floor now to any questions. We have about five minutes for questions. So um, any questions you have on the content, or even if you want to just discuss which part of today's talk resonated with you the most. Uh, so please feel free to uh, come up to the mic if you have any questions. Do you feel like there is significant progress being made in responsible AI uh, these days, you know, based on your 
experience and research? I, I mean, I've just begun studying some stuff with responsible AI over the last few months. So I don't know all of what's going on in the field right now, but what I've been seeing is that there is a lot of work and people are really uh, paying a lot of attention to it to try to get things right. Um, so a lot of companies are focusing on responsible AI. A lot of companies nowadays are focusing on something called privacy as well, which is keeping individual uh, people's data secure so that it can't be, you know, like someone can't figure out your personal data from a machine learning system. So a lot of companies like Google and Microsoft are all, Apple are all using this now. So a lot of companies are shifting towards caring more about responsible AI. And there's been a lot of issues in the past. Like um, the big thing that's been going on is, you know, disinformation on social media sites and um, like on YouTube, Facebook and so forth. And these machine learning systems are doing a better job at tracking down disinformation and recognizing it, even though it still does play a, a really big problem and big role in today's society. So there's a lot to be done, but there are improvements being made. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Does anyone else? Hello. So you spoke about certain metrics not being a good thing to set as a goal for AI. So what would be a good thing to optimize your AI for in that case? Would it be better to have a more uh, role-based system that has uh, logic built into it rather than just letting the AI grow by itself? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think that's that's like the probably one of the big questions right now. I. Uh, don't know fully myself of what would be a perfect goal for an AI system. I can say that going back to responsible AI and fairness stuff, some goals that are being made on AI systems are like across different groups of people. Um, like when we're looking at those RRC curves uh, uh, before, having the true positive rate for different groups of people be the same. So ultimately in order to have these uh, fairness things built into them, you do have to sac sacrifice a little bit of accuracy. But it can ensure that you know decisions being made are fair for all people. So those are better goals in general, I think, like the more fairness oriented goals. But it's really tough to specify really good goals that don't have unintended consequences down the road. So if I could give you a full answer to that, I think I could start go start a company on that or something. But it's kind of hard. Okay, thank you for your answer. You're very welcome. Are there any other questions? So I have a question that's probably no one here has the answer to, but it's more of a thought provoking question. When you think about AI, the goal is to reach humans up with intelligence. So we're doing these, like, maybe they you train an AI for a couple of days and then you, you're done. When you think about human AI, how long does it take to train a human? But from you're born with this brain that has no data, it's no training, and before you have an actual competent AI, it's at least 20 years later, right? So you have to train it. <laughs> to reach a human level AI, you have to train it for 20 years or more. So is there On that is there are we going to have to train computer AIs for years and years and years before we reach that human level oh ab absolutely like so a lot of the really huge systems that are being done like especially the work being done by DeepMind and people that really can afford this they measure in something called like I don't remember the exact metric name but it was like TPU years or something like that which is like if you have a super fast uh you know um thing that's able to process tensors and a bunch of other stuff it's a number of years that it'll take. And some of these models take hundreds or thousands of TPU years to train, um, which is like, yeah, in the human example, it takes maybe 20, 30, some, for some people longer, you know, longer to get to that point of uh, being able to integrate into society and, you know, be, have human level intelligence. For computers, it's even longer because like they basically start out and they make a lot of mistakes along the way. So it can take hundreds and hundreds of years. So even like you hear about these huge language models, those weren't trained overnight. Those are trained with hundreds of years of uh, Google CPU time. So you. you're welcome. I, th I think we're out of time. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>